Welcome to this week's Man Enough podcast presented in partnership with P&G, the maker of brands like Tide, Swiffer, Mr. Clean, Pantene, and Braun. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. <laughs> evening. Welcome back to the Man Enough podcast, or welcome if you've never been here before. I'm Justin Baldoni here with one of my best friends in the whole world, Mr. Jamie Heath. It's me. You're looking very good this morning. I am indeed. I got a whole facial thing. I did the whole thing. Uh, so why are we welcome, here, bro? Welcome here. to the Man Enough podcast. <laughs> we're at a podcast, not so, just to be bros, but to um, yes. So we are here to talk about to talk about men. And, and masculinity. I wrote a book called Man Enough, Undefining My Masculinity, this idea that as a man, I have been conditioned and taught a lot of things that I didn't necessarily agree with or think mm -hmm. were true or even realize I was being taught. Mm -hmm. And the book and this podcast and the show, everything is just about questioning, honestly, asking ourselves, is this good for me? Do I actually believe that? Do I think that? Where did this come from? Um, how do I feel? Independent investigation. Uh, independent of truth. investigation of truth, exactly. And you know, you are someone in my life that does that for me. I think we have that reciprocal relationship. You are someone that does that for me. And I hope that we can model and show that these kinds of conversations can be more normalized. Mm -hmm. And you know, the guests that we have. Speaking of guests, Glennon Doyle is coming on the oh, show yeah. today. Who? Tell me about Glennon because I know that she's super special to you. She is, um, and of course to Emily as well as my wife. She is. Uh, Glennon wrote a book, one of her books, but her most recent book is called Untamed. And, uh, and Glennon popped into my life at a really interesting time. I was writing Man Enough mm -hmm. and, um, and just, just really struggling, honestly. Struggling because I didn't feel enough to be writing it, <laughs> which is ironic. Which I, didn't is feel, I didn't feel man enough to be writing a book called Man Enough. Okay. And, uh, and I would just reach out to her and ask her things and she would make me feel seen and you know <laughs> tell me how hard the writing process is for even a professional writer mm -hmm. if you haven't read this book if you are a man while you might think this book is for women i encourage you to read glennon doyle's book mm -hmm. and i really appreciate that she's even taking the time today to come on to talk about men all right so let's get liz out here let's do it i love you i love you <laughs> <laughs> stick around uh we will be right back with glennon doyle on the man enough podcast yes sir Our amazing partner, PNG, aspires to build a better world where boys and girls, men and women of all backgrounds and abilities can learn, grow, succeed, and thrive with equal access and opportunity. Gender bias and stereotypes can get in the way of us truly seeing and treating each other as equals. This shows up everywhere. It's in our homes, it's in our schools, and it's in our workplaces. P&G, the maker of brands like Tide, Swiffer, Mr. Clean, Pantene, and Braun, is dedicated to supporting communities like ours, like Man Enough, where we undefine masculinity. See, undefining masculinity can help us create a more gender equal world, where everyone has a shot at achieving their dreams. Now, our conversations on this show can become uncomfortable, but they cover a broad range of topics with guests sharing so many different points of view. And those points of view are so important because having these uncomfortable conversations with influential people is so important, not just for the betterment of men, but for the entire world as a whole community. So thank you, PNG, for stepping up as a force for good in the world. Visit pggoodeveryday.com to learn more. Hello, and welcome back to the Men Enough podcast. I am Justin Baldoni, here with the wonderful, amazing, talented, intelligent, brilliant Keep author, uh, jewelry designer, <laughs> uh, blue sweater wearer, Liz Plank, author for The Love of Men. Hi, Justin. Hi, uh, you love men. I do love thank men. Thank you for writing a book because you love us. Thank you. And thank you for helping that. me with my book. Yeah. And thank you for doing this podcast with thank, me. I mean, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. I am so excited because we're about to talk to a mutual friend of ours. Mm -hmm. And I just got to say, I was introduced to Glennon Doyle via my wife, Emily, because she was reading Untamed, as were other, you know, millions of millions other women, of other women. <laughs> uh, this summer. Um, and I would walk into the room and she would just like be having this cathartic experience, like mm. um, crying and, and just feeling so seen. And so when I read it and 
uh, found myself feeling the same thing. I was like, wow, this is a, these are universal themes here. Yeah. Yeah. And Glennon has a, a very impressive bio. Uh, she's, we don't even have time to read her I, I know. bio. She's an author, obviously best selling author. They, this book has sold more than two, mm, two million millions copies. of copies. And she's written at length about, you know, addiction. These are difficult topics, faith, um, failure. She doesn't hold um, anything back. Exactly. And she also founded this organization called Together Rising, which has raised $27 million for women, families, and children in crisis. And she's the mother of three children. And she's married to Abby Wambach. Like, come on. Bowing. Yeah. To the queen. To the queen. Glennon. Glennon. Hi. Thank you so much for joining Glennon. us today. I in this beautiful so parade excited. of books behind you. I know. It's just, I'm looking at it like what an explosion. Of, but, you know, a lot of good books have come out this week. So I have to wrap them behind me. Beautiful. But Glennon, I've been so excited you. to hang out with you all. Yes. you. It means so much to me that you agreed to come on. You have been such a light in my life, especially these last, you know, five or six months as I've been... As I've been struggling finishing, you two have been finishing talking. my book, yeah. yeah. And she, uh, you, I'm gonna say you because I'm, I'm talking to both of you. Uh, <laughs> you really, and I know I've told you this, but you really came into my life at a time when I needed, uh, I needed a life raft, mm. um, and I needed help. And you've just been so gracious and kind with your time. And I just appreciate it so much. You know, I've read both your books, right? I have this unique um, position where I'm I'm both of your friends, and I and I get to admire you from now close and and also far. And reading Glennon's book this summer, and then immediately following it up with your book, Justin, there was so many connections that I saw between both your books. Right, Glennon's book is about the untaming best, women. The best compliment, and the I, I can't mean, even imagine a better compliment. They, I don't. Yeah. They really go hand in hand. Um, they should be whatever like bookstores are like suggested item. It should be <laughs> you know each other's book, because yeah, Glennon, you really go into detail about how women need to free themselves from these cages that have been imposed by our culture, by our society. And it feels like, and, and you talk about masculinity, you talk about your son and how this is also limiting for men. And it feels like, Justin, you offer the solution. Man Enough is the solution um, to this cage that, that men and boys are in as well. So Glennon, do you feel like Man Enough is almost like the, the male untamed? Yes. Yeah. I felt that from the first time I read it. I mm. actually felt it from the first time Justin and I spoke. <laughs> I felt like he was the um, male version of Untamed. Mm. And the funny thing is that people are always asking me, you know, back in the, in the, um, before when we used to have speaking events in person, <laughs> there would always be like two guys in the crowd that, you know, their partners brought them and they would say, what I, what I heard you say was interesting. Where's the male version of this? Wow. And what it always made me think of is all of the, the low so many years where I have been having to learn from male texts and male teachers, and I have never once <laughs> walked up to them and said, where's the female version of this? Like, like mm -hmm. I just, women are used to having mm -hmm. to find yeah. a commonality, right? To find ourselves in male teachers. So, um, so what I used to say was, I'm the freaking male version of this. Like, just listen again, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> But, Which, now, but, but it's true though. I, but, but I have to say though that it, it is like reading, reading your book, I felt that, mm -hmm. right? So I didn't, I didn't delineate like I needed a male version of it. I was like, oh, it's right here. Right. You know, well, that's because you're you. That's because you're you, okay? <laughs> but anyway, now that I've met you, I do now say, instead of the mean thing I used to say, I do say, man enough, Justin Baldoni. <laughs> Bye-bye. I just answer I am, I, with your book. <laughs> That is so. I I don't I don't feel worthy of that, but I it means it's, a lot. I mean, Liz, your videos help me so. I I sit on my couch and show Abby like <laughs> this is me leaving in all my exclamation points because I don't have like that gave me such freedom. I like exclamation points. I don't want to have yes. to take out all my exclamation points because I'm mm. trying to communicate more. I don't know what are we doing like more like a man or more, more like, like a, a man. Yeah, well, what version. you're referencing, yeah, is is sort of this idea that women have to, um, in order to get the respect of their male colleagues, talk like their male colleagues, mm -hmm. and even feminism, if you think about it, in in you know in in its mainstream sort of form, it's act like a man, mm -hmm. uh, get as much money as a man, 
write and, and sort of emulate male characteristics instead of what you talk about in the book, Glennon, which is, you know, empathy and mercy, right? Mm -hmm. And that those are quote unquote feminine mm. characteristics, but that those are the greatest threat to an unjust society. So for mm -hmm. men listening, okay, so what you're referencing is, so Liz made a video yeah. on TikTok, right? Or something. <laughs> Same thing. And uh, it may have been indirectly addressed to me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Justin commented, are those emails to me? Are those emails to me? Um, <laughs> so I was typing and then it's it's me, re you know, saying I'm replacing my periods, my, my exclamation points with periods. And then I drink out of a mug and I'm shaking like my entire, like the coffee's going to just like. Because, recap. and again, for because the men I'm listening, because if, yeah. as a woman, yeah. you feel that if you keep your exclamation points in, yeah. then a man will think what? Oh, we'll think, I mean, what What do you think, Lennon? I, that you're a bitch, right? Okay, you're... I don't think anything. What I know right. through repeated right. experience yes. right. is That's that there's right. no winning because if mm. I leave in my exclamation points, my smiley faces, my whatever the hell I'm doing, then um, that's too, too feminine, too girly to, to be taken seriously. Mm. But God forbid, this just happened to me this week, God forbid I don't put an yeah. exclamation point and I put a period and I say things in a, de in, a, in a declarative way without asking questions, without being too soft, then I'm a control freak. Mm. Then I'm mad. Then I'm difficult. Mm. Like the amount of times that I've been called difficult because I'm asking a question. Yeah. One time when I, um, when my book first came out, Untamed, and everything was going wild with, with COVID and the books weren't shipping, I called my publisher to ask where the books were. Okay, I literally was just said, can you tell me where in the chain the books are now? Mm. I got a call back from the publisher and my publisher said to me, um, so I know you're a control freak. So I'm just going to, you know, oh. I'm going to tell you all the things. There's no way in yeah. hell a male yeah. writer yeah. who asked a question about their business, mm. right? It, I feel like mo there's so much so much is gendered. Yeah, and wow. everything. And how does everything. how does that relate to masculinity, Glennon? Like, uh, like, because I, from my perspective, it's like we always tell women to act more like men, but we never tell men to act more like women. Right. Whether it's in the workplace, whether right. I mean, I think there's an extra couple words we need to add to that sentence. I guess, which yeah. is like, yeah. don't we're being told to act like men, but that's not a full thought. It's like we're being told to act like men are forced to act. Yes, that's right. It's That's all right. a performance, right? That's right? So it's not like men, and, and Liz, you do such a freaking beautiful job of this. That's the, the, the reason why your book is different than everyone else's for the love of men is that it's such a beautiful illustration of how caged men are. It's not like we're, it's not like we're trying to act like men are. Mm. We're trying to act like men act like. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah, 100%. Everybody's Point. just acting. Mm. So it's, it's the idea of freeing us all from these Mm. ridiculous expectations. We generally start off these interviews with a question, but we we just dove right in. So I'm going to ask you, Glennon, when was the last time you didn't feel enough? Mm. <laughs> well, I'm sure it was today, but I know something <laughs> happened yesterday. Um, I got in this, I'm in this situation now where I am trying to figure out TV in a way. And like this whole Hollywood world is so... I don't get it on any freaking level. Like there's a lot of assumptions made or passive um, communication. Mm. And I have learned to, you know, treat business deals or any group I'm in like a family meeting. Yeah. Like, oh, if there's a problem, it's just because we haven't let's, uncovered the truth yet. Let's you talk know? about it. <laughs> but it feels like maybe we're not supposed to uncover the truth yet. That's <laughs> all that I know. So you're, so you're talking about doing television. You're like yes. a television show maybe or yeah. or something yeah, along yeah. that and then yeah. and you're negotiating that or you're talking about that and the you're you're kind process. of saying, Hey, can we have a family meeting here with your lawyers and other producers maybe about something? And they're like not responding well. We don't do well that here. We don't do that here. Yeah. And so and so interestingly enough, I got a call that said, We need to chill out here because you're gonna you're gonna be called difficult. Like that was oh. the actual response. Because so you were being direct. Yes. So what yeah. I know is that if I were a man, mm. difficult would not, like if I had another, if I were another freaking book, it'll be called difficult. Like yeah. I, I don't know what difficult means, except that mm. I just keep trying to understand things clearly. Mm. <laughs> right? like, so I guess that, um, 
And I don't know if that's enough, but if that's not being enough, but it was a time where I tend to think I am doing something wrong. I am not good mm. enough for this scenario. It, it also makes me feel like if I'm if I'm feeling too small, it might just be I'm, I'm in the wrong room. Right. It's not like I oh, have to change. I might just have to not go back to that particular place right. if that place wasn't meant for me. And that, to me, speaks to this knowing that you yeah, talk so much knowing, about in, in, in the book. And how can men get in touch with that knowing in themselves as well when they're out in the world in these meetings and these environments? Okay, so one of my favorite stories from Untamed about that is, you know, I, I have a friend who a couple of weeks ago was making a big career change. And I said, okay, well, just tell me what you want for your career. And she said, Glennon, I don't even know what I want for dinner. And I was like, that's <laughs> what happens to us, right? We just, we lose the connection somewhere between mm. our head and our knowing or our, mm. and, and so the question for me for a long time was like, where does this connection get cut? And then I put a story in Untamed where I, my son Chase, I have a boy and two girls until they tell me different. Mm -hmm. And they had a bunch of friends over and um, they were all story, watching TV so. And I peeked my head into the room and I said, is anybody hungry? And all the boys, without taking their eyes off the TV, they all said, yes. Okay, so see what they did there? They mm -hmm. heard a question and then they went inside themselves and they found an answer and then they said it. So nailed this Q&A. But the girls <laughs> did something completely different. So each one of them took their eyes off the television mm -hmm. in complete silence. Mm -hmm and started looking at each other's faces yep. mm -hmm. to find out if they were hungry inside their own bodies. They were looking at their friends' faces, okay? And as I'm watching them, they, they do this some kind of mental telepathy where they're scanning <laughs> the room and they somehow <laughs> elect a spokes girl silently. And then this braided freckled child in the corner <laughs> looks over me like a freaking robot and says, no, thank you. We're fine. It's like the, it's like the, you know, the way that, you know how birds fly in flocks somehow, yes. somehow, and like, it's like, I feel like women have that. No, but it's, but it's also, we, that, it, we don't freaking know. You, to, we're not talking to each other. How, how no. could she know if I'm hungry or not? Right? I don't know. We're not talking to each other. We're not talking to each other. We're not yeah. looking for whether we're hungry. We're not looking for our yes. desire. We're looking outside, outside of ourselves for permission, consensus, yes. approval, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So. In that moment, I thought, oh, this is where we lose it because little boys are taught in moments of uncertainty to look inside themselves and find mm. their desire and speak it. And little girls are taught in moments of uncertainty to look outside ourselves. But 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 with that, though, if you think about like, you know, what I what I read about in my experience as a boy and a man was that I still wasn't allowed to go inside myself That's and think it. and feel because right. because like uh, in Brave Enough, right, I talk about um, standing at the ed at the edge of that bridge. And my and these and these boys are down below, and they want me to jump because they jumped, and I couldn't. I was afraid to jump. And then they called me a pussy, and they called me gay, and all the things that we call other boys to mm -hmm. make them feel less than, which mm -hmm. is a whole other thing that we can talk about later. Um, and I wasn't allowed, like like I was being signaled that I, that it's the manly, the boy thing to jump, but I'm not allowed to feel what I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if I go inside going inside then tells me to not jump because I don't want to because I'm afraid mm -hmm. of heights. Mm -hmm. But if I acknowledge that feeling, if I acknowledge my fear, mm -hmm. then I'm less of a man. So then that this, so by the same token, there are maybe there are times when we as men can go inside of ourselves and it's permissible to like go straight up to you after a show or to, to say, yeah, I'm hungry. But then mm -hmm. there's other times when it's not okay. And then mm -hmm. who makes those rules? Mm -hmm. What I believe now is that the way that I told that story isn't correct. The way that I say, oh, the boys went inside themselves. I think the boys reacted out of their conditioning just as much as the girls yeah. did. I don't think a single one of those boys went inside themselves. I think that boys are trained to be certain. Yeah. Right? To no answer matter loudly, what. To answer yes. loudly. To answer loudly, to answer quickly, to answer without going deep inside of themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You are listening to the Man Enough podcast. We will be right back. I believe that expectations based on gender, which so many of us have heard since we were children, are at the root of so many of society's illnesses today. Now, I want to change that for my children's generation and their children's generation. And the way to do that is with uncomfortable conversations. 
My personal journey started with me looking in the mirror first and then talking with my friends, friends like Jamie and Liz. Now over the years, we've had a lot of uncomfortable conversations, many of which I look back on now and cringe, but that means that I'm a better person today because of the conversations I had yesterday, because I was willing to sit in that discomfort and listen. I want to keep having those conversations and becoming a better human and then share those conversations with the world through the Man Enough podcast. Our partner P&G, the maker of brands like Tide, Swiffer, Mr. Clean, Pantene and Braun shares that mission of creating a more equal world, a more just and equitable world where boys and girls, men and women can all have equal access and opportunity to learn grow, succeed, and thrive. I am so grateful for their partnership in bringing these conversations to light. Together, we can create a better world. All we gotta do is stay in the room. Visit pggoodeveryday.com to learn more about how P&G aims to make it easier to create a better tomorrow. All right, welcome back to the Man Enough podcast. I have a question. What do you think that men can learn in order for humanity to be better of some of the skills um, that you put to, in, in place and like practice and the research you've done, what do you think is most beneficial to men in order that we may be our best selves? Mm, that's a big question. I mean, I guess one of the things that I think is most important for all human beings, regardless of what conditioning you're trying to undo, because gender conditioning is certainly, I think maybe the strongest cage we, we get put into, but I think being, taking a moment to be intentional, um, asking questions of ourselves and figuring out how much of who we are and our personality is true to us and how much is just our conditioning, right? which is what starting to ask the questions. Like, I don't even, I don't think that men are trained to ask, well, Liz, you talk all the time about directions. Like yeah. men won't even stop and ask for directions to the grocery store. So asking them to say, is my personality, like just my social conditioning, <laughs> it's a stretch. Okay. Yeah. Right. right. But that's why, I, but I think it's starting to happen. Mm. Yeah. And, and I think that, that books like Liz's book or Justin's book, I mean, I, I don't think it's too dramatic to say that I think that most of our planet's problems come down to toxic masculinity. Like, I think, like, climate change, mm -hmm. race relations, like, I think all of the, the, the planet's biggest, biggest problems come down to the patriarchal system we've set up in, not in which men rule. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is in which the, the, the characteristics that we have labeled mas masculine rule, right? These characteristics like um, certainty, like um, posturing, mm -hmm. like valuing power over people, like not negotiating, like f finding um, sensitivity or uncertainty as, as failures, right? And, and suppressing the characteristics that we've labeled feminine. Yeah. Like mercy, like compassion, mm. like curiosity. Um, so, Amen. you know, I don't, I feel, I feel sad for, for men who, who think that the way that they're acting out in their lives is who they are. Mm. Right. Yeah. So how can we mm -hmm. men support a woman being untamed? Because so much of, you know, unfortunately, I think of why, uh, you maybe had to write the book or wrote the book or was feeling everything you were feeling was because of the patriarchal system we're living in and and the 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 taming that has been done for thousands of years. But um, what can a man do to support women on their journey? And also the second part of that question is back to what you just said is, you know, maybe it's for men, it's unchained. Mm -hmm. Right. Because we like we're chained up in our armor. Like we have all this armor on that we have that we don't even realize that we have on our entire lives. And um, we put it on every single day, armor to protect us from the world. And then in turn, what ends up happening is that we can't even get to ourselves. We can't even get to our hearts because our hearts are just so covered in this armor. And we need to un take that armor off 
Mm-hmm. So those are my two, those are my two questions. Well, I think that what I would say to a man who says to me, what, what do I do to support women is I'd probably start with that beautiful quote that says, if you've come here to help me, mm. you're wasting your time. Yeah. But if you've come because your liberation is tied to mine, let us begin. Yeah. There you go. Right. Mm. So, so I think about this in terms of, you know, the way I used to think about allyship, right. To the black mm. community, which was basically like, what can I do to support you? Mm. Here you mm-hmm. go. I, here I am. I'm here to help. Right? Until, you know, years later in my journey where I figure out, oh, black people don't need my help. Like, they need me to figure my own shit out because yeah. the problem is whiteness. Mm-hmm. Hello. Right? Mm-hmm. The problem is my problem. The problem mm-hmm. is that somewhere along the way, white women make a deal with the devil. And they're like, okay. We are like, okay, I'll, I'll accept my proximity to power. And in exchange for that, I will um, sell everybody else out forever, hmm. right? So the problem is me, and I'm, and, and racism is a whiteness problem. So, so say that again. Just no, I'm sorry. Say that again. Say, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just saying, like wh- white racism is a whiteness problem, right? So hmm. it's not that my black friends have a problem that they need my help with, right? right? It's that I have a problem. Mm. that has completely and totally stolen my humanity, mm. Mm. right? And and I have a freaking lot of work to do to reclaim my humanity. If I do somehow reclaim my humanity, which means that I'm walking on this earth settling for nothing less than equality for everybody, not just my family, but everybody, then that will tangentially help out my black friends, because I figured my own shit out, Yeah. Mm-hmm. right? So I guess what I would say to a man who wants to support me is I would say, please God, the, 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 the best thing that I can do for my daughters, which is why Liz, what your work is so important, and your, the best thing I can do for my daughters right now is go straight to the boys. Mm. <laughs> the best thing we can do to free our daughter, to yeah. free our little boys and protect our daughters Mm. is to get to the boys earlier. Mm-hmm. That's right. Right? So I would say to to men, like, actually, and I don't mean this in any, you know, but, but, but like, we're good. <laughs> like, <laughs> we're, like, kicking ass, okay? We've been having to handle our shit yeah. forever yeah. with the way that you work in the world. Like, we've been, the same thing my black friends would say to me about white mm-hmm. women. Like, we mm-hmm. have been, yeah. we're good, like, what would be great is if you figured your shit out, if you went to therapy, if mm. you read the books, mm. if you sat with your own shit and worked, mm. because then my world would become safer and better if you get safer. So once a woman reads your book and becomes untamed, it can make a man feel smaller. Mm-hmm. I think many men want a woman who is untamed until they meet a woman who is untamed. <laughs> and and um, I've heard many times from women how a man can f- can feel emasculated by something that's not emasculating mm. um, yeah. or can feel less than in the presence of a powerful mm. woman. It's one of the reasons why I'm madly in love with my wife. Actually, mm. her power makes me feel like more of a man in many ways. Mm-hmm. But we're not, I don't know if we're conditioned, maybe because of the patriarchy and because of how yeah. this has been, to, to handle a powerful, untamed woman. Well, it's because, y- you know, men make themselves the main character all the time, including the main character in a woman's untaming, right? Like, mm-hmm. like the. I think I, I love what you're saying, Glennon, because like in a way, what you're saying is, is like you deal with your stuff, and like why why yeah. you feel small because I feel powerful is your stuff to figure out. And I think if men stop making themselves a main character and become a great supporting character and work on that, yeah, they're not the hero in the movie. They don't yeah, have to be the hero not, in the movie. Yeah, you're the hero in your own life. You're yeah. the main character in your life, and I'm the main character in mine, right? And I think we get into trouble when, again, we condition men to think that they're always the main character, um, oh. and and unfortunately, we condition women that they're often the supporting character. Um, but if we, mm-hmm. yeah, if if we, I, I just love, I just love your response because I mm-hmm. I think it is a reframing of the problem of female empowerment or even mm. gender equality as a woman's issue or a woman's yeah. problem and saying, no, it's actually a man's problem because we're good. I just wanted to say back to you, I think it's a, an important question that you raised though about how we respond to other people's untaming because when you reverse that, I've seen very often in my friends and in myself, when we want our partners, our men to become untamed, 
okay? Mm-hmm. Which for a boy might, or a man might mean to become vulnerable, to become uncertain, to yeah. cry in front of us, to tap into their feelings. And then they do and we lose our freaking minds, okay? Mm-hmm. Because that is a really interesting, that. But that's a really interesting point. Mm-hmm. Wait, so what do you mean? Well, what I mean is when somebody untames themselves, it challenges our own taming. When somebody deconditions, it challenges my conditioning that says, oh, wait, but I but I need a man to be really strong. And like, if you're not being strong, then who's yeah. the strong one? That and then, wait, wait, is just, such, so, that is a thing that's not talked about enough. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I want to pivot to, uh, you know, Glennon, you are still a member of, of, of your Christian community, but you, you know, criticize it. Well, criticize is not, it's sort of like the, the way that James Baldwin would talk about America, right? Like, I right. love her so much, and that's why I want her to be better. That seems to be what you're doing with the church. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm curious mm. how that relates to undefining masculinity, because in a way, masculinity and, and this idealized masculinity, um, patriarchy, is also an extremely powerful institution. So mm-hmm. what's your advice to men um, who are going up against uh, something as big and, and an institution as old as patriarchy, given your experience mm-hmm. going not just after patriarchy, but also or, the church. Or for men that don't even necessarily know or have ever heard the word or know or believe it exists. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would, I, I don't know if it's possible for people who don't grow up in a fundamentalist religious situation to understand how, overwhelmingly powerful um, it is to learn patriarchy, but in terms of God, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of what God wants and what God allows and that God deems the man the leader and that God is a man. And that, Mm -hmm. you know, the first story you learn, uh, the first story I learned as a child was the story of Adam and Eve, which Mm -hmm. is Basically, like my teacher sits us down and is like, we're going to teach you about human beings and God. And I'm like, okay, that sounds important. Here I am, right? My little curious self. And she said, okay, so the way the world starts is it's God and Adam and they're like bros. They're like best friends and everything's perfect, right? (laughs) And then this bitch Eve shows up and she gets hungry and curious and she goes for what she wants. She just can't leave well enough alone. She just can't be grateful for what she has, right? She has to want more. She, she gets out of her place. And then the whole world falls apart and all suffering is unleashed forever. Go with God, girls, right? <laughs> so so the, the, the idea that is planted in every single realm mm. of the world that women are, well, that women are, are there to be supporting roles mm. for a man, right? that women are dangerous, that yeah. women are not leaders, that women are not, are inherently bad, right? Mm. That we cannot trust ourselves, yeah. that we cannot trust our appetites or our desire, and mm. that we will lead men astray, mm. right? I mean, that's what you see in every single, that's, that's a freaking Yoko and John story. That's mm-hmm. every, every story that we have about men and women yep. is that we, Meghan Markle and Harry, yep. like every there we story go. is mm-hmm. that the woman will lead him astray. Mm-hmm. When trying to undo that is hard enough in every category when it's not presented to you as God-based. I mean, what I would say is the reason why I was able to get free of much of that, and I'm certainly not free of all of it, is just the simple realization that there's a difference between God and religion. Right. Well, that's that true. God is not religion. Mm. Okay? That those are two different things. Yeah. And there's a difference between masculinity and men, okay? Yeah. Like God to me is beauty and love and freedom and good. And religion is a bunch of gatekeepers and cages that that, that, that was created because we can't really control that. And we like to control things, so we made it mm-hmm. up. God is the water and religion is the cup, right? That we're trying to keep it in. And men are good and, and, and human and, 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 and love, but masculinity is this cage, right? Mm-hmm. So, so it's so important to me to think about, um, well, Liz, I just think you do such a beautiful job of doing this. I mean, even with the title for the love of men, like it is none of this is women versus men. It's, it's men and women and non-binary people and all genders and between gender and beyond gender against gender conditioning. Yeah. Beautiful. All of us together. You know, in our short relationship, you, you were really kind to me and generous when I felt like I wasn't enough. Mm. Um, 
And I'm just curious if you can, if you can offer anything in, in terms of how you're raising your boy, mm. what are you teaching him? What are you teaching him about enoughness? Yeah. I got sober the day that I found out I was pregnant with him. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I have never been a vertical upstanding citizen without being this kid's mom. Okay. We kind of came to life at the same time. I always say that he's the one who brought me into the world. Mm. And he um, he's 18 now. He's getting ready to to um, go to college and I'm feeling very balanced and completely mentally stable about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will tell you some things about him. Let me tell you my favorite recent story is that a couple years ago, um, he sat us down and he said, I got to tell you guys something. You And it was just me and Abby and the two girls. And he said, I'm gay. So my first, first of all, I started, I burst out laughing. Okay. Because I'm just crush it as a mom every time. And I always have the exact right reaction. By the way, I watched that time. video of, of you when you were apologizing and the fact that you can't, you can't, can't. apologize without laughing. I think it's hilarious. <laughs> it's one of my favorite yeah. things. And so you burst out laughing. So he says you're gay. He says I'm gay and you burst out laughing. Yeah. Cause I thought he was joking. So that was awesome. So then I look at my girls and they're, <laughs> they're looking at me like, mom, no, not mom, the time. No. Right. So he's already told them, which, which makes my heart just want to break in. It's so beautiful to me that he, he told them a long time ago and they just all were waiting oh. until he was ready to tell us. First of all, I just thought, wow, there can be no one on earth who has worse gaydar than me. Like <laughs> my child, like I, when Abby and I were talking about it after, I was like, I've been staring at that child literally all day, every day, every minute for 18, 16 years. Mm. How did I not know he was gay? And she said, well, to be fair, you didn't know you were gay either. So <laughs> just... Exactly. So... Did Abby know? Fun. No, though, that's the thing. We didn't know, Justin. And now, like, I will tell you, the day after he told us, we came home and we walked into the kitchen and he and the girls were, like, dancing, doing this Broadway show tunes thing. And we were like, how the hell? Did we not know that this child, like, we just, sometimes when you're staring, you will find this. It's like sometimes when you're staring at someone so hard for so long, you do not see them. Yeah. Like, you just, it's too intense. It's too, like, anyway. So, so it was just this beautiful, incredible, mind-blowing, like, you just only get a few moments when you're an mm. adult where the world actually surprises you, mm. you know? That was one of them. Yeah, that was one of them. And so... I asked him when he's going to tell his dad. I'm I'm a little nervous about him telling his dad because although I would never have expressed this, but although this is not true and and it's just absolutely wrong in every way, there was a little bitty part of me that thought maybe Craig would think I like made him gay because of wow. being gay, like mm. right? It's like and and I didn't know, I was just having all of these fears and confusions and 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 worries about how Craig was going to react. So Chase told, tells Craig, he calls me, he's like, I'm about to tell, tell daddy. He's like a week later. So I tell Abby and we're driving. And like an hour later, my phone rings. We're in the car, Abby and I pull over and I pick up the phone. It's Craig and he's like, holy shit. And I was like, I know. And you guys, this is the first thing that Craig Mountain says to me. He goes, Glenn, all I can think about is what, if you had not been true to yourself. Mm. Maybe our kid would never have been brave enough to be who he is and tell us who he is. Wow. I know. I know, that made me tear up. I remember when I told Chase that I was going to marry Abby and I was going to be with Abby. I remember saying, like, we are a family who is true to ourselves, who tells the truth about who we are, even if it breaks other people's hearts, even if it makes other people uncomfortable. And I'm going to show you how that's done right now. Mm. And you're going to, it's going to be really, really upsetting. I love that part. It's going to be really confusing and we're going to get through it together. Yeah. I I think, you know, I I write in my book, um, I learned the most about men when I started dating women. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'm curious how that relates to you, right? The the gender dynamics that maybe you had with Craig, um, did they dissipate with Abby? Are they different? Have you learned more about, you know, these heterosexual dynamics and how they can corrode a relationship? 
um, by by yeah. dating Abby? This might sound too dramatic for some people, but I feel like sometimes being a woman and growing up in the culture that we live in that has so much misogyny, it kind of changes your shape and the way that you show up in the world and makes you a little bit ragey and makes you a little bit skittish and jumpy. Um, Abby would describe me as very skittish and jumpy, and that's because I'm used to the way I just have learned to adapt to the world that I'm in. Um, and she hasn't had to adapt to the world the way that I have because she looks, she presents so differently than I do. And she is, uh, um, she assimilates with men in a way that they respect her in a way that I, I, I just watch it like, what the fuck mm. what the actual hell like the way that they they turn into different people with me than with her different totally different how different like, what down, does it look like down to the hugs oh like the, hugs. the bro hug did they do, oh my God. Did they do the bro this, hug like the one hand in this thing yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this this situation that we i've tried pull to each like, other in and then we use the other hand to cover up and like do a pat like, on the back yeah okay. like like a yeah. okay well you know what it is i just realized it the bro hug is you have your hand, you have a physical barrier between your hearts. Mm. And that's it. That's what Justin, it is. It's not the bro too hug, close. Yep, it's, you're not too between. close. You have not a barrier between your hearts and the regular hug is a vulnerable hug. Mm. Holy mm. shit, that's Justin, what it is. I've been doing it my entire did. life and I didn't even realize it till just now. Wow. That's a whole thing. That's a so whole thing. So she gets thing. that. Abby gets that. And, and all I know is, I don't know how to describe it other than it's it's a bunch of, it's a language and a way of being where there's a million secret handshakes like that. Yes. And well, she's I also one of the greatest of athletes ever. Yeah, so Let's they respect be her because she could kick but, their ass yeah. at what right. they have been taught to value right. each other. There, there you what go. I would say about marriage, when you, when you get to the, a same gender marriage, is that it's like you realize how many assumptions you make right. in a... That, that you didn't, wouldn't think that you'd make because you think of yourself as an evolved person. And then, mm -hmm. but like, for example, I spent the first year being like, okay, for sure, we might be progressive, but you are not, I'm not taking the fucking trash out. Are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> and like, also who gets the spiders? <laughs> like, it, it's sure not going to be me. I know in my house, it's me. Because Emily has a fear, oh, that's like true. a and deadly fear of spiders. Two women who gets that? Like, if you're two women, why should is, I is assume she's afraid she's of spiders? Get the spiders? Well, here's the deal: she is deathly afraid of spiders, but she has enough toxic masculinity in her <laughs> that she will pretend not to be scared wow. of the spiders, so as to assume the the, the um, masculine role in our relationship. It's so interesting it's because I see how much of it has nothing to do with men and women. Because we have so much of that shit between us. Yeah. How many times do we go to a car place or go, and, and the, the, the men only talk to her? Mm. It's wow. not about man and woman. It's about whoever is Who more presents. patriarchal yeah. presents more that. masculinity mm. in the wow. relationship. So even so it's it's almost so endemic that even even the sniff of it is enough yes. to 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 like set off that dynamic like this like someone can sniff it out like you can feel mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. which yeah. which is interesting and which is also one of the reasons why i think undefining it is so important because for for men who are on the spectrum of appearing and acting and feeling more mm -hmm. feminine mm -hmm. right and just gravitating towards that mm -hmm. then they again it's they don't feel like they're a man like they don't mm -hmm. feel like they're allowed to be like they're not a part of even though they are a man they feel and present more feminine Mm -hmm. And then they're not taken seriously right. and they're bullied. And so, so it's very interesting to hear that that even happens in, in, a, in a relationship or a dynamic with two women. Yeah. It's so funny. It's like, how are you going to be sexist when we're both women? But it, it happens all the, <laughs> right. all the time. I had a question regarding your, um, your explanation where, where you were talking about like the spider and like mm -hmm. she's assuming the role of the toxic masculinity. I'm wondering, is it possible that this whole toxic masculinity thing is hard to unravel fully because obviously all masculinity is not bad. Um, it's toxic though, the way that we attribute it to different genders and this and if you're not. Okay, so grabbing a spider is just a, is a courageous thing. It is re requires bravery. I don't think it's a masculine thing, right? Does it have to be that? Can it just be that there are, like for instance, my wife is courageous and brave. I won't touch a spider or, or the rats that we have to kill sometimes. <laughs> I can't get near it. Mm -hmm. She has no fear with that, but I don't look at it like, oh, she's masculine or in this area. She's just brave. Why is it well, that, I think why can't bravery whole... and courage can't be also attributed to feminine, 
qualities. Yeah, I think you're getting at the core of all of this, which is that there's no such thing yeah. as masculine characteristics or fem- what we're talking about. Yeah. It's like we, we have to we have to work inside of that construct right now because that's what's affecting people's lives. Mm-hmm. Right. Just like race is made up by white people. Right. Mm-hmm. Like creating our entire hierarchy based on race is something that white people made up mm-hmm. to control power. Yeah. It's not real, but we have to work inside of it right now because it's affecting racism is affecting people's lives. Mm. Yeah. At the end of the day, what we're going towards is that there is no such thing as masculinity and femininity, yeah. right? right? Masculinity is a bunch of human characteristics that we've tied up, put in a bucket and said, these are for men. Yeah, that's right. Femininity is a bunch of characteristics that we put in a bucket, said, these are for women. We yeah. made it up. So, mm-hmm. What, what we're when in going fact they're human mm-hmm. they're human right mm-hmm. and and so what we're going towards is this is why all these like gender reveals and the gender so so crazy like it starts to feel so ridiculous it's like yeah. it's like deciding in, in utero is this your kid gonna be a nurse or a doctor like right freaking no it's right. made up right. it's like what we should do is have these babies and then decide what are all of the characteristics that a beautiful human being shows mm-hmm. yeah. illustrates yeah. has. And then do everything we can to give every single human being permission to express all of those. Because masculinity, femininity, it's no characteristics are gendered. It's just that permission to express certain characteristics mm. yeah. are gendered. Yeah. So we Love have to that. allow permission for all characteristics to be expressed, no matter what gender mm. a kid identifies yeah. with. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear you talk yeah. about it, Glennon, and yeah. to hear you talk about all of these things because you are. You are, you're my Yoda. <laughs> Same. <laughs> you're Yoda. Same. Uh, Same and so can we wrap this up with some rapid fire questions? Yes. This make me sweat, but I will do no, my no, best. No, 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 they're not. They're, they're easy. They're, they're easy. Okay. Especially for you. <laughs> Welcome to this week's Man Enough podcast, Rapid Fire Questions, presented in partnership with P&G, the maker of brands like Tide, Swiffer, Mr. Clean, Pantene, and Brung. When is the last time you went to therapy? Um, probably about three months ago. We're 70 years, 90 years in the future. You're a ghost mm-hmm. at your own funeral. Mm-hmm. What do you hope is said about you, about how you lived? She did her best. Mm. One time um, when I'd been sober for a long time, maybe like seven or eight years, I realized I'm doing my best. And I know for a lot of people that probably seems simple, but for so long, I had not been doing my best and there's nothing worse. I don't need to be perfect. I don't need to be amazing. I don't need to be the best at anything ever. I think that's like a crazy making way to live. Mm. All I need to know at the end of the day is that in my relationships, in my work, that I did my best. Mm. Mm. Okay. Do you feel enough? Mm-hmm. Mm. Hell yeah. I'm like extra. I'm mm. like oozing all over the place. Definitely enough. I'm trying to learn to not feel too much. And right? when did so that my, when did that happen though, Glennon? When did you start feeling enough? Hmm. Maybe in sobriety. I mean, mm. I just feel bad for every single person who hasn't had a mental health crisis. <laughs> I really do. And I mean, I no, I, I'm serious. I, I actually yeah. really I agree. serious. You you become part of these programs and and yeah. and you learn how to freaking take care of yourself and you learn what matters and what doesn't. And, yeah. and so that's why people in recovery are the best people. Yeah. They right. Are. So you let go of yeah. all of that shit, but you, you understand that there's no there, there in the ambition and you're never going to get there. You're never going to grow up. Mm-hmm. You're going to be stuck with this self forever. And Glennon, I just uh, want to take this chance to, for any men who are listening, um, if you could talk to a man, who's listening right now, trying to get from his head to his heart and integrate them both, trying to free himself and become untamed. What would you say to a man who's on a journey to becoming man enough? Well, I'm not just saying this because I'm on this podcast. I actually do say this quite often. Um, I think it's scary, scary as hell to start, you know, practicing being fully human, especially when you're part of a group of people who might not react well. Right. So it's easy for us to say, yeah, go talk to your bros about this or that. But then we're not there for the fallout of that, which (laughs) I've heard can be rather rough. Right. So I think there's there's safe places where we can start to explore this stuff. For me, that has always been books. Right. I mean, I think that 
sitting down with man enough, sitting down with for the love of men is that's like that's how the the spark starts to kindle and how you what you learn, like what I learned in recovery and what I learned is that all of these little individual problems you think you have inside are not personal. Mm. they're not your problems mm. yeah. they're structural problems and millions of other people are having those exact personal problems because of the culture we live in and that makes you braver so before you start you know calling on yourself to go out and practice sit and learn and figure out that you're not alone books yeah. are the best books are where we learn about other people without annoying other people <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to our partners at P&G, the makers of brands like Tide, Swiffer, Mr. Clean, Pantene, and Braun, for helping to make the Men Enough podcast possible and for sponsoring these fun and real moments with our guests. Glennon, you you are uh, you are so wonderful and generous and graceful. Thank you so much for, for agreeing to come on and talk. Mm. What you all are doing is really, really important. If, 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 if the planet's problems, if we're right... Mm -hmm. And the planet's problems are directly related to gender conditioning. Mm -hmm. Then the work that you're doing is some of the most important work in the world. So keep doing it and keep being brave and love mm -hmm. you guys together. Ditto. Thank, Thank you, Glenn. You. Thank you so much. This was so awesome. Thank you. Love you guys. Thank you, Thank you for you. every, every moment. single thing. Bye. 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 Oh. She's a... Uh, She's something else. That was amazing. Uh, you are listening to the Man Enough podcast. We will be we will be right back. Welcome back to the Man Enough podcast. I'm Justin Baldoni. I'm here with the wonderful Liz Plank and Jamie Heath, and we just uh, we just went to church with Glennon Doyle. Yeah, that was a whole service. Mm -hmm. um, that was amazing. That was she incredible. Right. I was seeing my mom and her man. Yeah. Um, and seeing her brilliance, see, because I can't always see my mom's brilliance because I'm so close to it, close to it, and mm -hmm. affected. Yeah. But I'm not affected by her life. Um, uh, you know, uh, I don't Personally, have trauma with it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but then I was so grateful for her. So then it made me think, why am I not grateful for my mother? Mm. And then all the twelve step work I've done because of my life blowing up and then bringing back, and I'm grateful for that. So um, that part when she talks about her. Mm. When she was saying that uh, everybody should have a breakdown or that too bad yeah. for people who don't have a mental breakdown or some sort of, that got me good. But Jamie, do you think the 12-step program, every man should do a 12-step program? 100%. Right? In some way. You can tell when you meet a man. And that's what's, done but, that. but that's what's so interesting is I've noticed that the people that I, the men that I gravitate to the most or that I'm the closest to or that I feel that. the safest with are all men that have had some experience mm -hmm. with the 12 step program. Oh. Or at least things like it. So for instance, there's something you're not invited to Justin, unfortunately. Um, on Thursdays, I have a group of men that we get together for about two hours. Um, it's all men of color. We don't talk about bad about white people. It's not about that. It's just about our particular struggles and yeah. feeling safe in that. And yeah. then championing ourselves and mm -hmm. like, you know, working through things. Mm -hmm. But because we do it and kind of do it like a 12 step program, Mm. We get vulnerable. People start crying. Yeah. Every Thursday, I can't wait for this meeting. Mm. Um, and it's men doing it. And like you see some men that are like, well, you would never expect it. You know, big men with the mm. whole thing. And then there's men that are soft-spoken also. Mm. And then everybody, when they do that, we, we end up being better. Yeah. And our wives are like, okay, go to your Thursday yeah. thing. But that's what's interesting about the 12-step program that. and the, the program in general is that it encourages a safe place to share. That's right. Right? So you can share anything and you know that it's safe because there are rules. And unfortunately in our world, especially as men, we're taught really? growing up that if we share, that vulnerability can be used against us. So in our group of friends, how we share is we know that by my sharing my pain or my struggle or my plight or what I'm, or something about something personal about my wife or or you know a struggle with porn as an example or whatever it is that someone that one of those guys is not going to throw that back in my right. face or that's tell right. another guy or use it against me right. and that's what's safe about right. the program but here's the thing like when 
you when men don't create safe spaces for each other, oh. women have to create safe spaces for men, or women become the safe the, space. The, well, right? And that's the problem. And that's why your wife loves that you're going to this program. That's right. And that's why she would probably, as Glennon said, the best thing you can do for me. The best way to take care of me is to take care of you and so that I don't have to do that. And, you know, we talk so much about how women who end up being in relationships with men, one of those dynamics that I certainly yeah. learned about, again, when I would date other genders, um, I'd be like, oh, no one's, like, unloading on me in that same way. Or mm. I'm not expected to, to really, you know, help this person yeah. analyze every problem they've ever had. Um, well, you know? because, well, that's the thing. Is, yeah. and, and for many men... Who are in, um, you know, hetero relationships? The women become the therapists. Yeah, and then of course that creates a whole bunch of issues with, with sex and polarity everything. and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Because it's like, you know, if you're dumping on me everything, mm -hmm. then there's no space. There's yeah. no space for passion. There's no space yeah. for for the sexiness. And that's why. And that's why it's so important for men to be able to have other men outside of their relationship, outside of their marriage, to talk to. Like, because there's certain things that. Emily knows she doesn't, she can't bring to me because it might be about me. And while she's not going to go and like rip on me and mm. talk down about mm -hmm. me to her other women, there is a, an element of her needing a safe space with another woman to maybe work through something. And she understands that it's the same thing that I have um, with my friends. Like I might reach out to Jamie about something that I'm struggling with and it, as it relates to my relationship, but it's not for Jamie, it's not for me and Jamie to go and like, oh, we'll bash her or anything like that. It's like, mm. I need to unload yeah. on someone that isn't my wife because yeah. she doesn't have to hold everything. Right. That's right. But most men don't have that. Exactly. And so if you're a man listening to this, I think it's really important that you maybe look for that yeah. or take a step in that direction so that you aren't just having one person mm. that you are unloading everything on. Because mm. your wife, if you have a wife or your girlfriend, can't be your therapist. Yeah. Maybe and have a therapist. Maybe hire a therapist. Hire a therapist. Yeah. And and it's not just bad for her. It's bad for you. To your point, less sex or the sex is going to be nice. Well, and you're not or, trained. Right. You're exactly. not trained for that. Also, like, yeah, she's <laughs> not a trained therapist. The advice she will give you might not be as good. So just you know, let's get put everyone in their lanes. I'm curious about what you thought about Glennon. Yeah. What do you think about Glennon? Like, what is something that Glennon. you learned or Glennon. that you thought um, was valuable? I, I have her book in front of me and every, almost every uh, page has like a big underline and a big circle and a big star. I feel this personal connection to her and, mm. and, and what she shared. I also loved, you know, she referenced Cast, which is this amazing book by Isabel Wilkinson, um, that the great thing that that book does with race is saying, this is made up. White, like white people created this and this is why now it's in our laws, it's in our, it's on the books, it defines opportunities, um, but this is a made up system. We have to talk about gender in the exact same way. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is made up. Like men can't wear high heels, that's made up. Because you know who invented high heels? Men. Men. For, For women. Men. I did not know that. They See? Didn't. Okay. So. I d well, there we go. Yes. <laughs> you know what Persian, I don't. Persian. I don't love high heels. That's okay. And I that's don't okay either. Too. I'm wearing, I'm, I, I wearing think kicks. <laughs> I like bare feet, but if if you want to wear high heels, great. But I didn't know men. Unless my yes. wife was salsa so dancing. They when would, she's salsa dancing, then them high heels. Well, I've seen your wife. Yeah, she, she's got them. I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, can, but but so, right? Like these are, yeah, it's, it's, there's going to be punishments. If Jamie, you walk out in high heels out in the street right now, you're yeah, going to get that. stared at, you're going to yell at, you mm -hmm. might even, your safety might be, uh, it, you know, put at risk. But this this was made up. Mm -hmm. So we need to, when we're having these conversations about gender, in the same way that when we have conversations about race, you know, we have conversations about racism. We don't, I don't think we should be saying race. I think we should be saying racism because race was made up. We're one human race. Mm -hmm. Same thing with gender. We should talk about sexism, right? Patriarchy. These are made up systems. Thank you for all the different tapping yeah. occurring. Yeah, well, I love but it. But it's true. I mean, you got you brought up a very good point. One thing that brings to mind for me is we all are one. These are things are made up, but we also are different. See, I, I don't want us to have this idea that like sameness. There is some, you know, there yeah. is men and yeah. there are women. There are races made up at the same time, while it's made up in the constructs and all of the oppression that's in there. Um, I don't want someone to not see me. It's like we never want to get to a place where exactly. we are all just like it's made up. Look, I want you to see me as black. I want you to see yeah. me as a man or as a woman or as Latino or whatever it is. But for us to be the same and to be cherished the same and mm -hmm. um, not see me as a threat or different. But our differences may be celebrated. Celebrated. No. Yeah. So and it gets tricky when, we, when right? we talk about that we're the same. 
and yet we're different, you know. But right. even women and men as categories, right? I mean, we're having this whole debate about um, trans athletes, right? How do you mm -hmm. define gender? And in nature, um, a lot of, of, of things, a lot of species don't even fit into this, uh, you mm -hmm. know, binary. And so I think, yes, I agree with you. And, and it's not the same as race. Um, nothing is the same as anything, right? right, right. Like, we can't, you know, be equating these um, yeah. conversations, but... But yeah, I think we need to get better about, I mean, again, she says, you know, th that knowing, like, what part of this is me? Mm -hmm. I think that's such a, an amazing exercise. Wonderful. That mm -hmm. everyone should do all the time, right? Um, so what, is that, um, what does that look like for me? What is that yes. knowing? What do I, and I think we can distill it down to that. And, and, yeah. and man enough, I talk about the why ladder, like that we need to ask ourselves why. And the same thing I think goes for who we are as people or what we like or what we don't like. Instead of seeking external validation or, or doing yeah. everything because another man does it, why don't you ask yourself, well, what do you like? Yeah. What makes you feel strong? What makes yeah. you feel powerful? What it's makes good. you um, happy? What makes you cry? Why are you saying that? Why are, why, why are you intimidated by, by that woman? who's untamed or mm -hmm. whatever it is. Why are you doubting yourself? Why we're addicted to this or what conditioning leads us to that? Then I think that's the first step yeah. in maybe becoming even yeah. untamed yes, or yeah. unchained. Thank you so much for uh, for listening and watching our show Man Enough. I'm Justin Baldoni. I'm Liz Plank. And I'm Jamie Heath. And, uh, and please like and subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to your podcast and, uh, and follow us in all the places that you can or should... Uh, Follow us. So weird. Right, social media. Be, I social media. So, I have such a weird I just have such a weird relationship with yeah. social media. I hate saying follow me. All right. Uh -huh. But either way, if you feel like it, please do. All right. Bye, everybody. <laughs> I love it. Keep that one, please.